Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Leonard Duncan, your host of ATV Talk. Uh, this is the morning show brought to you by ATV Talk, a motorsports podcast. Um, our Danny Duncan is my co-host, uh, Danny Duncan II, to be ac accurate. We have some special guests with us today, uh, Chad Konarska and Corey Witherall. Corey is... Uh, the famous race car driver that everybody knows and been on the show many times, but um, we need to thank some people for making this happen. GBC tires. Uh, they are a huge supporter of ATV talk and the ATV industry. Um, so if you're looking for ATV tires, truck tires, UTV tires, go check out GBC. They'll get you some, they'll get you some good tires. And I know that they'll do the job for you. Um, Elka suspension, the leader in ATV shocks right now. They also make UTV truck shocks and, and others. So go to your uh, dealer, your local dealer, and uh, you can get yourself some Elka shocks. They're good, good, good products. Stand behind it. Been using them for years. Won lots of championships with them. DBR Racing. Uh, this is a new uh, company that we started dealing with. They make uh, an EXO box for the Vortex. It mounts super securely. Uh, it keeps it from having any issues. They make some other products. You should go to their website, check them out. I think you'll really enjoy using their products. Um, <clears throat> today, it's kind of a special day, guys. Um, I know my son and I are both huge Patriots. Uh, Memorial Day is um, wow. tomorrow, but it's a huge race weekend for everybody in the country. I know, Corey, you've celebrated it at Indy. Um, none of us, I believe, have gotten to go there. Uh, it, so, it's, it, so it's a big, big thing. Um, Memorial Day actually started as Decoration Day. Um, I don't know if you guys know the history on it. And... Um, it was just about putting flowers and wreaths and flags on graves of fallen soldiers um, in the in the Union. Uh, and uh, I know I get a little uh, choked up, Danny. Ray, you can chime in anytime and help out with this. Um, our grandfather, my grandfather, Danny Ray's great grandfather, in World War II was on the Wasp when it was sunk. Um, fortunately, he lived and was saved. Um, he was pulled out of the water by the USS Duncan. There is a, a, a paper article that you can actually read uh, on those events. Um, to all the men and women that have sacrificed their lives and given it for the, this great country, we want to salute you and say thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Um, it's uh, it's an honor to uh, be able to be as free as we are and to do the things we are. We do. We get to go racing. We get to play for a living because of the things and the sacrifices that these people have done. So make sure you pass that on today, everybody. Um, I know it's a little heavy right in the beginning of the show, but uh, I needed to get it out. I needed to uh, to say those things. Um, so, gentlemen, how are we? Good, good, good. Fantastic. So, Corey, when you were at uh, when you're at Indy, what's it like to go through a celebration like that? Oh wow, we we could talk hours. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty exciting, it, huh? It's it's uh, a world of events going on like the whole month of May and the day like today before the starting of the race. I mean, it's just nonstop chaos as far as like the fans coming and just the whole time schedule of what you as a driver have to do before the race starts. I mean, you're, you're there at the track like at 6, 7 in the morning just getting ready for a race that starts at 1230. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty but incredible. There, a timeline, though, for the drivers. You have to be at certain places at certain time for like drivers' introductions, and you have to meet someplace. You have to do all your your uh, meetings with the with your team, and then meetings with the Indy Car guys. So it's 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 a pretty busy morning before the start of the race. Well, we'll get, we're going to get into that a little bit. I wanted to talk uh, a little bit of. Um, a little bit of uh, racing. Um, Chad, you're more knowledgeable about this than I am. And I think Danny is, is more of a fan than, than I am. Enduro cross. Enduro cross is not something that's widely known in the United States. It's growing. Um, it, it became prevalent um, where it was more of a mainstream sport in 2000 in the United States with the United States championship. Um, as it moved into Europe, 
Uh, it got really big in the 2013 and 14. Um, and this is where I'm going to kind of trail off. There is yeah. a guy that I have followed and I have watched a bunch of his videos, and that's Taddy. I think you know who that guy is. He's from Poland. The guy is a phenomenally, phenomenally talented motorcycle rider. Um, he rides so KTM. Uh, he did ride a KTM. He signed a contract in 21 with Gas Gas, which is KTM. But that's yep. neither of you there. <laughs> Just a red KTM. We're going to uh, – Chad's going to go into the definition of – of what enduro cross is right now yeah yeah no th yeah thanks leonard uh pleasure to be on the show um yeah so for like for those that don't know enduro cross is basically taking all the uh difficult bits of a, a normal outdoor enduro race the logs the rocks the the water crossings and they you know put them in the stadium in an arena um, and they race it like a motocross, kind of like your typical supercross, arena cross. Just but instead of the, instead of the jumps being made out of dirt, they're made out of tires. Um, incredibly entertaining. Uh, the the guys that are at the top are just unbelievably talented. Uh, they don't typically. You kind of mentioned this, but like the enduro cross series started out super strong in like kind of the early 2000s there was a lot of people showing up it trailed off a little bit in the last couple of years but it's sort of making a resurgence um it also kind of reminds me of like supermoto in that same sort of deal where it was like really big for a few years and then kind of disappeared and then now it's coming slowly back um but it is incredibly entertaining racing the uh you know it's it has it has a lot to do with the skill but also luck <laughs> as, as in any racing case uh and so you'll see, you know, it, you just never know who's going to win because of that. Like it, it, a little mistake, a little mistake in a motocross race will, will cost you, you know, a, a half a second in a corner. In an enduro cross, it costs you, you know, a little mistake could cost you three to five seconds, you know, which, which is half a lap. It's it's incredible the uh, the changes that happen that take place in a race, you know, just because just because you're the best dude doesn't mean you're always going to win, which makes for excellent spectating. Unless you're Taddy. Unless you're Taddy. Well, Taddy, I mean, Taddy's legit, but Taddy's getting old, too. Uh, so right now there's a dude uh, named Tristan Hart. And uh, he didn't win last year, but he was leading the points up until the very last round. He was one point ahead of uh, Johnny Walker, who's another incredibly talented. Uh, he's from Great Britain. Um and he's Johnny Walker's usually more on the extreme enduro side, but then he started doing enduro cross and was great at that too. Um, but yeah, so Tristan Hart, I think is I think this this coming year is probably going to be his year. Uh, the dude's legit talented, and he's been doing it long enough now. He, he's one of the I, I believe he's one of the younger guys. But yeah, I think that uh, he's he's going to have a lot to to bring to the table next year. Um, when they race, the, when when they race, is it seasonal or is it year round? Yeah, so kind of pretty much all these guys do multiple series. Enduro cross is just one of the series they'll do in a year. A lot of them will do uh, the extreme enduro series, uh, which <clears throat> is sort of has historically been more in Europe. Like you know, uh, the famous ones are like Romaniacs and Erzberg and. Uh, you know, I think like Sea to Sky, Red Bull, Sea to Sky is another big one. Um, and that's all takes place in Europe. They are starting, there are starting to be more extreme Enduros here in the States, like King of the Motos or uh, the Tennessee Knockout. So they'll do like, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's almost like Supercross and Motocross. You know, there's an indoor series and an outdoor series. So they'll do the indoor series part of the year and then they'll go and they'll do the outdoor series. <laughs> um, one of the questions that the fans have asked is, what kind of machines are they using? We didn't get into that at all. Is this yeah. exclusively motorcycles or do can we use ATVs, UTVs or other vehicles? Yeah, so uh, I would say the, I think the only extreme enduro, well, I guess I, I would call it an extreme enduro. I don't know if it actually is, would be the King, King of the Motos or King of the Hammers that happen on two different weekends, but in the same location. Um, that one, the King of the hammers is the is a car race and uh, people race utvs in there too uh king of the motos just strictly motorcycles 
the all, all the other races, all the other extreme races are just motorcycles. Uh, the trails are way too tight for anything else. They're uh, just single track, tight trees, rocks, things like that. It would it would be darn near impossible, I think, to get an ATV through some of those sections. That's what they say every time about ATVs. Say, <laughs> it's not over, man. There's a whole nother thing that you can get into that you haven't done yet. You know. Yeah. What, a, what about uh, Billy Bolt? Is he's he still do, is doing extreme enduro? Did you hear right? me, Corey? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, didn't to, you, didn't, you didn't want to come back and race no ultra cross? I don't think I don't think Corey wants to do uh, enduro cross. No. <laughs> Colton Hanker, if you want to check out what enduro cross is and some of these in, extreme enduro cross races are and what Chaz is talking about. Look up Rare Exceptions. It's a Colton Haker movie. It's mainly about him. He's a multi-time champion when it comes to Enduro Cross. And it gives you a layout of both, like he was saying, the indoor series, the stadium series, plus the outdoor series. And there is a lot of really talented, really great riders that are in that. Um, what is the gentleman's name? I'm drawing a blank on who's won that thing a crazy amount of times. Older gentleman used to do, um, he used to do uh, the, where you have I think, to. I think you're talking it? about Jar, Jar, Graham Jarvis. Graham, yes, Jarvis. Jarvis is uh, another one that's fun to watch. He's yeah, just he's, incredible bike skill. Oh, amazing. He used to do where they can't put their feet on the ground, trials riding. Yeah. And he so should have. Patty won championships in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, and so did uh, Cody Webb, who I'm also looking kind of remiss in, in mentioning. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we're going to shift gears here in a second, but di- doesn't Destry's Abbott's son mm-hmm. ride this stuff? And he yep. produces a bunch of his own videos. And it, that guy is just extremely talented. He's never won anything? No, uh, yeah. I, I don't think Cooper, yeah, so Cooper Abbott, Destry's son. Um, another a, extremely talented dude um i got <laughs> i got the pleasure of racing him when he was like uh 13 years old i was like four years older at the time but he was racing my class because he was that good um but yeah he's super good kid uh i call him a kid he's not that much younger than me um but he he uh has never won a race in enduro cross i don't think i think he's he's had a podium or two um and he is up there uh, but I think he's still just a little off the pace of like your top four or five dudes. He's off the pace, dude. That's incredible because those videos, the yeah. things he can do on a motorcycle are just phenomenal. Things all them guys can do on motorcycles are phenomenal. So, gentlemen, what we're going to do is we're going to roll into our our big segment of the day, which is IndyCar. Uh, Corey, I, I know that I... I brought you in. I wanted to make sure that we gave you ample time to explain the Indy 500 to all of our listeners. Today is a traditional day in the United States. Actually, it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon that the world tunes in for this race. Um, we started uh, racing this in 1911 under a different name, and it went from 1911 to 1916 as, a, as like a sweepstakes race. In 1919, in World War II or World War I, it was a, another form of a, of a sweepstakes name. Uh, the milk came in to be the first time it was buttermilk in 1933 and in 36, and then it became a normal C. Uh, if you win the Indy 500, you drink the milk, and then some foreign guy came in and drank orange juice, fit of Paldi, you know, which they should have freaking... They should have put a nail in his foot right then, but they didn't. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, Corey, I, I, let, let, let's hear it from your perspective. You're the guy that's actually got to go do this. Um, and, and just for a little history, just for the listeners, Corey raced ATVs and progressed his way through ATVs, through off-road cars, then to asphalt cars, and then got into Indy cars. So this guy has a huge, wide variety of, of abilities and stories he can tell us, but we're only going to get into his IndyCar days right now. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, no, no problem. It's uh, an honor to be on your show again. Oh, dude, trust me. You know, it's my honor. We, we have these conversations uh, on the phone and off. You, you know how much I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I enjoy it myself and everything. And 
you know, the one thing I want to say, though, like like yourself, what you mentioned earlier when you, when you first came on was that, you know, my dad, too, was in the Navy. He was a lieutenant during World War II, you know, and he was still a little too too young to go out and fight and everything, but he was enlisted in the Navy at that time. So it's, you know, a big thanks to everyone who has uh, served. Yes, thank you for your, for your uh, father. So yeah. let's get into it a little bit, brother. Let, let's talk about uh, the, the IndyCar and the evolution and, and some of the history. Uh, I know you were getting into your driver's schedule when we first came on this and started the show. Um, roll through a portion of uh, a portion of your day. And, and if you could fill a little of that in with some of the history behind why they do some of the things that they do. Well, Indy for the race, I mean, it's it's the whole month of May. You know, it, it starts like the very first weekend or that Monday right after the the first weekend of May. And it goes like three weeks. Now, some of the traditions have changed over the over the years. Because the qualifying has changed and just the, the field count is not like how it was back in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So they they had to make modifications to qualifying and uh, and then they added a, a road course race before the 500 to make it like a whole month long. But before it used to have like two weekends of qualifying because you had like 60 drivers or 40 drivers trying to make a field of 33. So it was very like when I did it, there was I think like 45 drivers trying to make the race. And it was over two weekends. You had like the first weekend was Saturday and Sunday qualifying. Then bump day was the next weekend. And you had different, you, you only had like three attempts, three tries to make, to, to qualify. Um, you could try to do, do a qualifying run, but if you take a green flag, you ask, that's one of your attempts. So like on your third lap, you can wave the flag, a yellow flag, and then wave off your qualifying attempt so that you can try it again if you're not up to speed. They changed that rule. So now you have like, I think, unlimited attempts. So some of that stuff has changed over, like I said, over the last like couple of decades or the last 10 years to, to um, just to make qualifying more exciting. But uh, one of the things is, things is that after you qualify you have a whole week of doing like nothing <laughs> so to say other than like like um leading up to the race you have the whole week of like you have a couple practices in carb day but you have a lot of downtime but you're just going over strategies you're going over the car you're going over like you know plans and then the whole month of may there's tons of events going on whether it's corporate events, whether it's uh, for the Speedway or whether it's for IndyCar themselves, you're invited to go on to these charity events throughout the whole week and up until the day of the race. So it's 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 just like a whole busy mess the whole month. But it's a, it's a are fun those, Are those events that you get invited to, are they mandatory? Uh, they're not mandatory. They're, they're, they're open to – for – the drivers to attend if they want to most of the drivers will go to them like they have like a, a golf charity tournament uh usually sometime in the week between the last day of qualifying up to the race they have a, a fashion show charity where they have the drivers come out and do the do the fashion shows so there's a lot of traditional ones that where a lot of drivers will go to yeah how competitive is the golf event? Do you guys get extremely competitive when you guys are out there doing the charity events? I mean, as a driver, I'm not a driver myself, but as a racer, I can promise you I'm going to be out there trying to win that golf tournament, whether I suck at golf or not. <laughs> yeah, you're, all, you're always competitive, whether you're driving that golf cart or driving the golf ball. You're, you're always trying to shove somebody or doing some sort of like, you know, racing gesture while you're out there. <laughs> So I got in the chat here, we got a question. Uh, what is IndyCar racing? So I know Chad, Chaz knows, Danny knows, uh, Valeria. I don't know. Doesn't know, but the, 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 we have listeners that maybe they only race ATVs. 
Maybe they only race motorcycles. We have listeners that don't even participate in motorsports that just like the conversations we have. So, Corey, could you get into exactly what IndyCar racing is and and this maybe the style of car that we're using? Uh, how do you explain what is IndyCar racing? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. It's it's basically basically. Um, an open wheel car is what they call it because the the tires are exposed. So if you got if you look at a stock car or a NASCAR, those are like production cars, or they look like a production car that you can just buy at a dealership. Obviously, they're not because they're highly modified and it's just a body over a, a total built race car. But an Indy car is pretty much the complete opposite of that you know it's just it's four tires with uh, an engine and a tub that you sit in with little side pods and a front wing and a rear wing i mean if you pay attention to i guess like formula one it's a similar car but different rules and different you know um different specs about the car but it's just a fast car that's that's like a rocket and then <laughs> it goes like at the indian at the Indianapolis, it goes over 230 miles an hour. It's just a very fast race car. That- I have a question for you as a fan. You as a driver, so you see some damage happen to the front wing. How much does that affect the driving and the turning ability when you're in the car? Because I see him change the front clips all the time in the pits. How much of it really does affect the, does it affect the speed you can carry or the turning? What does it affect? It affects everything. The handling, you know, it, just doing like a one degree of, of front wing and everything, it, it will slow down the car. Like, you know. Okay, is, is the degree of the front wing down or up or is it either direction? It can go either direction. It depends on the handling on the car. So, like during the race, they would if the, if the driver is complaining that the car is um, not turning in or or it's it has a lot of understeer, um, which means that when you turn the wheel, the, the front end just kind of slides. It doesn't point in at, as as sharp, so it's not really gripping. So they'll do uh, put more. Uh, front wing in the car it's a quick simple deal they just got a couple of knobs on the front end of the, of the nose of a car and they just turn it and it'll put it into uh whatever like a half degree or or like one degree into it and what it's doing it's just lifting the wing up to create more downforce which is pretty much pushes down on the front end more so that the front tires will grip better that can also light that that can also lighten the rear tires when you push the front end down, correct? So yeah. So if you are having the other issue with the car, if you're having if the car is too loose and it has a lot of oversteer to where you're going to turn that rear and start sliding around, and they made other changes to the car to where you can't get that rear end to slide to to stay stay planted, um, or yeah, I mean, they could adjust the wing to affect the rear as well. So they could, um, if it's too loose, they could, like, take wing out. They'll do the reverse effect and everything to try to balance out the car. Because if the front end, front end is sticking way too much and that rear is sliding, it's just going to, at some point, you may lose control of the car. So they may take wing out to make the front end lighter and everything so the front will slide a little bit more and then the rear will slide just to balance out the the, the lack of grip, so to say. Okay. But then you got controls in the in the car too. You have like a weight jacker and you know sway bar adjustments you can do. So you can soften the rear end or to make it bite better or use the weight jacker, which raises and lowers the right rear tight or right rear suspension. So oh, if you're badass. shifting and weight to the front left, if you're lowering it, it's shifting weight to the rear. So that's kind of like a, a sway bar that you can adjust on the fly. Yeah. In the car today, before in the car today, you just have a button on the steering wheel, you push it, and then it'll, it'll adjust the, the rear end one way or another. It'll, it'll lift it up or, or lower it down. It's only a very small the suspension. 
So, so what it's doing is pretty much just compressing the spring. So I have a question, but Valeria has a question here that wants to go back a little bit in your conversation. Go ahead, Valeria. Uh, the water driver pod. What's the driver pod? What's the driver what? The driver pod. The driver pod? Yeah. You mentioned that there was a driver pod. Oh, the, the side pod. We're on the side of the car. So like you, you sit in the tub, they, they call it a tub, which is the main chassis of the car where you That's sit in. That's basically what she's asking about is the, the tub. I apologize. Oh, sorry. My bad. So, so basically that's the chassis of the car. It's, it's basically, they call it a tub because it's almost like sitting in a bathtub. <laughs> so it's just like a, it's, it's, you know, basically where the, all the pedals, where you see and the thing that's, that's around you, that's the main structure of the car everything bolts to that like the front suspension bolts to the front of the tub the engine bolts to the back of the, of the tub and then the transmission and then the rear suspension bolts to the transmission and then the under tray which is like the floor so to say that bolts to the bottom of the of the tub and then that's where all the electronics and all the radiators and everything hangs off of that on the side of the car. And that's what the side pods, and that's what covers all on all the side deal. So the tub is like the main structure. I mean, it's it's like I said, it's like a bathtub and it, it's super strong. It's all made out of carbon fiber. It's all composite and it's super light. I mean, to break one of those, you have to really hit really hard and, and, it, and it happens. <laughs> so that was designed and built just for the safety of the driver. So you have to get in a mold to make that for you, don't you? Yeah, the tub itself is like, is that one size fit all? It's the seat that when they make the seat for you, that's what's molded to, to you, to your to your size and fit and everything and how you want to sit in your position. So, I mean, like some guys, uh, I think he's not racing this week. He crashed on Monday's practice and fractured his back. But there's a driver named Stefan Wilson. He qualified the race for, for today. And during practice last, just like four days, five days ago, on Monday, he crashed and uh, he fractured his back. So he's out of the race. But the guy's 6'4". <laughs> then he wow. got someone like me that's, that's 5'7". So there's, you know... It's it's a one size tub, and then the seat just kind of forms around you. You turned down the call. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, brother. Um, they put uh, they put. We'll see. Like uh, Graham Rahal didn't make the race, so they put him in the car. <laughs> they called him and said, "Hey, you know, he got bumped out, or they weren't. They never. He, he got bumped out because that team never got up to speed. You know, Bobby Graham Rahal. Rahal. Yeah, Ray to speed." What's that? Graham Rahal couldn't get his car up to speed. Yeah, Rahal Letterman, their 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 whole team, they have four cars entered, and only one of them qualified during qualifying. And then oh. three guys, the other three guys, there was 34 car, 34 drivers entered for the race. And so for the last day, the last four cars trying to qualify for the last row were all were other than one was that. Was it Stephen Wilson? No, it was somebody else. We're all Ray Hall cars. Three Ray Hall cars trying to bump their way in. Wow, that's horrible for Ray Hall. Um, and then Graham Ray Hall, Graham Ray Hall's teammate bumped him out of the race to get into the race. Oh, so, hey, you should have went a little faster, shouldn't you have? <laughs> oh, they couldn't get up to speed. They're only doing two. I mean, I say only, but they're only doing 230 miles an hour, and that was it. I have a question. Uh, where do you race the indie cars? Like you said, a track or race, indoor uh, racing, or uh, where do you race this? Oh, uh, well, it's it's in Indianapolis at a very big racetrack. So it's it's uh, two and a half miles long. It's like a giant rectangle, and it's just you know like like a regular car race or or um, an oval track. Not not a, not like a street race or a road course race. It's just out in the middle of Indiana. <laughs> basically, Indiana. it's a giant. It's a basically a giant stadium 
that you have the, with a racetrack in it, and they race the cars in there. And so how do you win that? Like, what do you have to you do? You have to go 500 miles and be the, be the car that's in the lead when they throw the checkered flag. <laughs> right? Is that summing it up? For the most part, yeah. I mean, there's so much more. I have a question before we go on. Sorry, Chaz. No, no worries. You're talking about the rear suspension. Do you think with the technology advances that we have today that AI will come in and be used to set your your suspension on your car while you're driving? It's got to be a feel. Yeah. I mean, I think the rules won't allow that because it'll just get way out of the cost will get way out but i think it'll help probably conf- at some point maybe help dial in the car so my question is this though with ai the ai can't feel can't feel what the driver is feeling so the ai may do adjustments that are not what you're feeling so i don't think that the ai will play a factor for many many years especially because how much of it's feel i mean go back to the story about marty hart back in the day i know it's not indycar but he him telling grandpa that you know his seats a quarter of an inch off quarter of an inch off and he grandpa's like you can't feel that and then the spacers on the three-wheeler were turned upside down which changed the seat a quarter of an inch making it harder for him to turn feel like that i mean these driver you as a driver Corey, you have to feel all of that by the way the car is moving, everything, the, the AI doesn't have feeling. They can have sensors, but that sensor doesn't necessarily fit the way that that driver is going to drive that car, I feel like. It, it would be like a one-size-fits-all for the car, and everybody's going to have this setup for the car, but not everybody drives the same. You don't drive into the corner the same. You don't brake at the same points. So it's there's so much feel when it comes to driving and riding that I don't feel like AI will be there for years to come if it's allowed to progress to the point to where it can do that. Because well, right now, I mean, it, not to get political, but in Congress, they're trying to suppress the amount of AI that we're u- using. So I, I think they should, but that's beside there. the point. In Indy, um, do they have the same type of tire sensors for heat? So when you watch F1, they're, they're reading the temperature of the tire and this tells the guys in the pits the balance of the car by the way that the tires are wearing. Do they have anything like that in IndyCar? Uh, I'm not sure if they have a heat sensor in them right now. I know they have air pressure sensors, so they know what they know, like the air pressures of the tires when they're up to up to um, the optimum, you know, pressures and everything for when they come out of the pit lane and you know, when they can really start picking up the speed and everything. But, um, you know, the, the AI thing, you know, you, it, it's, it can help more or less on setup, you know, trying to find setup, you know, where I see where I can find, you know, like this, like they say, I mean, the, the real answer is like what your ass tells you, you know, while driving a car. I mean, you could do and say so many things you want, but it's just the feel of your pants and everything, you know, and how the car handles. So as far as like AI goes, you know, when you're trying to explain to your engineers and everything, what's going on with the car, why it's not churning or how it's handling and the changes, I think it can only really help as far as finding that perfect setup because it's all done by computer. So these cars have, over 300 sensors throughout it, you know, on the on the on the upper on the push rods, on the suspension, on the tire pressures, to everything, so and on the steering wheel, on the brake, on the throttle, everything. So they they know everything what's going on in the car and how it's handling in the in the pits, and they can watch it on the computer. So with AI, they probably could take a mathematical equation and figure out and see, or the computer could figure out and see, you know, where you are on the track and the rear end of the car breaking loose to where me as a driver might be having a problem in a turn and not really figuring out why it's causing that. It may be able to pinpoint what's the reason and it could say, well, look, it's compressing the suspension too much over here. So you're more likely a dip. And then it could probably kick back, you know, what to do to make the car handle better for that turn because there's bumps or like a dip or something like that. 
but but you're right you know if it, it's not driving the car the driver's driving the car and it comes to driver feel so what you're saying is the same dyno that we use in atv racing is the same dyno that you use in indy car racing which is the seat of your pants because when you're riding your atv the best way to feel it is you the rider because you're going to be able to tell the shock tech or the engine tuner what adjustment to make on how the machine's working same with the indy car correct yeah for the most part yeah because it it, it, it does come down to you you know you the driver and, and how you feel because you know there's obviously something telling you why can't you go you know flat out through turn one or turn two you know you might feel like you can but then you get to there like no nah, i'm gonna crack the throttle and, and and lift a little bit so and an indie crack in the throttle means that you're going backwards correct you're slowing down you're not going as fast as the guy that can stay in the throttle all the way around right yeah you're just like breathing the throttle coming off of it like five percent or ten percent whatever i mean just to get a little comfort for for it to turn into the to the turn and that's in the, go ahead chess no as i was gonna say like so so these guys are they just in the throttle like if, if your car's handling really good it's sticking to the track are they just in the throttle like 100 percent of the lap or is there a lift point before the corners today's car you're pretty much flat all the way around once once you get the car set up perfectly i mean you're pretty much like flat all the way around during like practices and, and qualifying. That's what you try to aim it to. But then once you get flat all the way around, then they're kind of like, okay, now it's start taking wing out of the car. So when you watch qualify, you look at that rear wing, it it's goes back like this. It's like negative four degrees. Or <laughs> that's creating a lift. It's not creating downforce. They're trying to take all the arrow all the arrow off of it. So I can make Make That's how they bigger. increase their top speed, correct? Yeah. So they, they they try to make the car as free as possible down the straightaway because the straightaways are five eighths of a mile long. I mean, they're really long straightaways there. So, so that's a, a lot of car a lot of cars passing on straightaways because they're just drafting each other down down the straightaways going to turn one and turn three. So with that, do they have a button on their steering wheel to be able to change the adjustment of that for turns versus so like? Looking into Formula One, they can change the the, the way going down the straightaway versus in the turns, opening it, closing it, moving at different angles. Do they have the same thing in Indy? No, because it just comes down to rules. Okay. They, they don't allow that. So they, if they're going to change the the wings, the wings and the wing angles, they have to come and do it in the pits. Mm -hmm. Do you think, being from Indy, do you think the Indy car? cars themselves are i know that there's a difference in budgets rules everything like that do you think if you had the indy car series and the formula one series go up head to head against each other do you think the cars are competitive with each other or just completely different they're completely different the engine packages are different in the the size i mean if you i don't know if you've ever seen an indy car but they're pretty average in size, but if you look at a, a Formula One car, your first impression is going to be like, "Wow, I think small." <laughs> I mean, they're 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 a lot smaller than an Indy car. I mean, they're they're tiny. I mean, they're 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 like the size of like an Indy light car, or like you know, a smaller car than I don't know, like a, I don't know if you know what an Indy lights or a Toyota Atlantic car looks like. They pretty much look like uh, Indy cars, but they're just a smaller version of a of an indie car and okay. they, they last and they're the engine the engines are hybrids they're both electric and and gas power so and that's for their philosophy is that they want to be fast around the churns so obviously with an electric engine it's like instant torque right off the very beginning so that electric engine kicks in when they're after they're braking, when they're coming around the corner, like a tight corner, mm -hmm. that electric engine kicks in and then until the gasoline engine could catch up to it and then pull it down the straightaway okay. so that they could accelerate faster out of the corner. Okay. 
I mean, I got a one for you. Do you think that IndyCar will ever go electric motor? Uh, they do have the Formula E series right now, <laughs> which goes all over the world. You know what? That's a good question. I, I don't know. I think they'll find some other technology of fuel that the government will allow. I mean, hydrogen. Well, and the IndyCar races tend to be really pretty long races, like three hours or so, right? Like they're. Yeah, it, it there. You know, the, the five hundred usually goes about three to three and a half hours long, depending on crashes. So I mean, it's, I, I you know, going those speeds. I don't know if they have a battery that will last that long. <laughs> yeah, change batteries, cars or something. Buzz into the pits, jump out of one car, jump into another car, or, or change the battery. Too much money <laughs> and time. Well, they don't make any noise either. So what are the fans going to get into? That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's like, is Supercross going to have electric bikes? I mean, that would be kind of weird. That would sound like an RC car race. I, I don't, I don't believe electric technology is ever going to – well, it may be at some point long after I'm not walking the earth. Um, I, don't, I don't think that you're going to get away from fossil fuel engines um, just for cost reasons. The, the electric stuff – you know, to, to, to dig up, well, I don't even want to get into all that, but yeah. I think that, I think that the, the sound and the spectator wants the noise. So what are you going to do? Put a speaker on the car so that it makes a sound as it goes down the straightaway. Yeah. yeah. Or like one of those, uh, viral videos of the dude sitting in the back with a trumpet. <laughs> 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 but I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, if it was if Supercross was all electric bikes, I mean, it's you thought people, you thought people, you know, cried when two strokes bailed out and four strokes came in. How it doesn't sound the same. It's like wait, wait until it's electric. <laughs> they do oh, have wow. that electric bike that not to switch gears to motocross or anything, but they had that electric bike that did the uh, Pikes Peak and did extremely well with Pikes Peak a few years ago, it was on any, on any Sunday, but I don't know if they have the technology. Chaz could probably speak to this more than I could with the electrical bike. Yeah. The, the Stark, the Stark Varg is a new one coming out. I think that the first ones just got shipped to the United States just a couple of weeks ago. Um, supposedly, I, I can't remember the exact horsepower number, but they're supposedly faster than your typical 450. I have no idea about range or anything like that, but if they're if they're as light as a 450 and they're producing more horsepower, it's you know it's it's a matter of time. <laughs> would you still, as a fan of Supercross and motocross, would it offend you if they went to electric motorcycles? Uh, I I just want good racing. I don't care what they're riding. If it's good racing, it's cool. But I I do. I mean, honestly, I like. To me, like a four-stroke engine doesn't sound great. I missed I missed the sound of two strokes. <laughs> so we've already we've already gone a step away of, of where I'd like to be, uh, just as far as like the the fan experience, the sound. Um, uh, it, but yeah, but, but they brought back the, the 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 legends that we want to see ride with the four-stroke motors, extending careers it's long true. past what a two-stroke rider could do. Um, yeah. So if you really want to know about electric bikes and electric motorcycles, go to episode 165, Andy Lagston. He's a gentleman here in, in uh, the L.A. County that's building electric motorcycles. Um, he has some range distances for them, some weights, and, and, and has done some things uh, far more than anybody else I know. I'm sure that somebody else out there is doing it, but we have had that conversation. Um, as anti as I am, I'm still open to learn about it and, and see. Um, we need to, uh, to, to move into another direction here at, at the end of the show. Um, Corey, you may be interested in some of this stuff because I still think you're a, a motorsports fan. Um, there's a lot of great racing that's went on this weekend. And Danny, I'm going to let you start with uh, uh, the outdoor. So you give a little update on what's going on with the outdoor stuff um, here in Southern California. All right. So it was at Paulo yesterday. Um, great racing. The first moto, honestly, was a little bit boring. Jet hole shotted and 
ran away. He had like eight seconds on lap three and he ended up winning by 13 seconds and kind of put it in cruise control. It, the second moto for the 450s was very interesting. Jet hole shot it. Chase Sexton got third off the hole shot past Fernandez very quickly. And for the rest of the race, they were a second to a second and a half apart. The gap got to about three seconds and they just stayed that way. Uh, from the interview afterwards, it sounds like Jet kind of just put it in cruise control and was kind of waiting for Chase Sexton to try and make a move. And Chase said that he tried to make a move with about 10 minutes to go in the race and made a mistake and never got the chance to come back. And then you saw for the last three laps, two, two, three laps of the race, Jet and Chase put the hammer down. I mean, you, you saw Jet gap it pretty quickly. And then he made a mistake going into one of the corners right before the uphill. And he got, I don't know if he's almost like he hit neutral in the corners and then shifted and went up the hill and it was great racing. And when they came off the bikes, let me tell you, jet was not sweating. He wasn't out of breath. He was, you know, completely fine. Chase was sweating. Sexton was definitely sweating. He was definitely giving everything he had. And that's my biggest worry for the entire, for the series is, is jet just running away with it. I will say that uh, Cooper Webb was back. I was super happy to see that. And he hadn't been on the bikes. And he went on the bike first time Thursday from, from uh, you know, having a three and a half week layoff from his concussion in Supercross. He got fourth in first moto, fifth in the second. He did fade in the second moto. He, he was 39 seconds or something back. But he did extremely well for not being on the bike for three weeks. He had two motos going into the two motos that he raced on Saturday. Ferrandez rode extremely well. I, I'm not a big fan of his, but he did. I mean, he he rode extremely well. He got third both motos, and he had pressure on him the whole time. Uh, Aaron Plessinger went 5-4 four for fourth overall and for the day, and I was very impressed. Him and Ferrandez, so first and second had a second, uh, one second gap between the two of them, and then third and fourth had a one second gap in between the two of them for most of the race. So it was really good, really competitive racing. Um, in the first moto, Aaron Plessinger should have podiumed honestly, but he made a couple mistakes and laid it down one time because of a lapper kind of came into the corner together. The lapper was super slow and he had to hit the brakes and laid it down. And then the second time was just a mistake from him, but overall good racing. I'm super excited to see Aaron Plessinger. I think when you get back into some of the races that could possibly be more mud races. I think Aaron Plessinger is going to be extremely, extremely good, especially coming from his GNCC background. Uh, 250 class, the first moto, RJ Hampshire destroyed them. He won by over 10 seconds, was gone. And in the second moto, he crashed in the first or the second corner and went back to last place, was coming through the pack, crashed again right on the uphill. And in the middle of the uphill, he crashed. He had to pick his bike up in the middle of the uphill. It took him some time, and he ended up coming back and getting 10th in the second moto for third overall. And Deegan, uh, Hayden Deegan, Danger Boy, he got second for the day. He was pretty, pretty consistent, and you saw the first moto, it was very competitive for second on back with Joe Shimoto and the two KTM kids, Max Voland and Vial. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He's a French guy. He's won two MXGP title titles. And uh, it was, it was pretty competitive. And then the second moto, everybody, it kind of just, everybody crashed and Joe Shimoto, Max Voland and RJ Hampshire had to play catch up the entire moto. Well, that's that's awesome for those guys. Uh, I asked you to look up something as well from our last episode in GNCC. Uh, we were talking about uh, the XC1 Pro Bikes and the 450 class. Um, these guys are awesome. Um, Corey, why he's looking that up really quick. Who's going to win today in the Indy 500? Who's going to win? Wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Indy's really competitive this year because usually, you know, you have like the Chip Ganassi team and the uh, and Penske's team, usually the, the guys who run up in front at most of these races, you know, 
but this year, I mean, Andretti's pretty competitive, and surprisingly, um, the Aero McLaren team they're they're up in front. Those I think they got like four cars starting in the first two rows. No offense, so, Andretti comes from an amazing <laughs> family. Why is he so slow? Who Rejo? <laughs> Andretti. Andretti. Uh, Marco. He, Marco Andretti. He's driving for his dad's team, so he's he's only doing the one-off race, which is just this race and whatever. He's not really full time in IndyCar, but they got like four other, three other drivers in the race. How do you think but, a NASCAR driver like Kyle Larson will do? He will do fine with it. I mean, it's it's an oval, so he's comfortable on ovals. It's just getting comfortable with the speed. You know, it, it's still it's still the same. Um, he's a very talented driver. So there's there's two types of drivers or riders. I mean, like whether you're racing motorcycles or whether you're racing um, cars or or driving or something like riding or driving. And you guys seen or we've all seen like all different types of motorsports so to say and we all see all different types of drivers and riders and everything and when i say there's two different types of riders and drivers there are ones that are very talented that can jump on anything and win and then there's ones who are very talented who are just the best at what they do meaning like you might have like a guy that's probably like the best old driver but it's a terrible road course racer or or a guy that could drive an indie car then hop in a stock car or jump jump into like like a sprint car and still win any night so like larson he's kind of like that kind of driver he could jump into anything and, and win and tony then, stewart was like that too right what's that tony stewart was like that too wasn't he Tony stewart's like that i mean you know i i could do the same thing you know robbie gordon there's there's a lot of drivers like that but then there's also the few that are only good at their particular sport. Like I know guys who are like the best sprint car drivers, but they try to do NASCAR or any car and they just can't get it. And, you know, they just will beat you any day on the dirt track. But when it comes to asphalt racing, they just you know, can't do it. Or same, same with stock car. You know, there's some guys out there that are the best stock car drivers but can't hop into like a road racing car or, or an Indy car and, and do it. Yep. Not talented enough at this, you know, obviously they did probably didn't experiment with things, but you know, there's some people who, who are like that. Some people are like the best Indy car drivers, but can't drive a stock car. So, but Thank like, you know like Carl, like Carl Larson, I mean, that kid wins in almost anything he can hop in, you know, or race with any team and, and win. So I mean, awesome. so so it, it's it just you know, you, it, it just it's a different a whole different feel and everything. Like there's like like so, one month. Yeah. Like so you're not going to pick a winner, are you? I'm going I'm to go with the McLaren team. I don't know who on that team, but they they've been pretty fast. That's like that's like playing uh, horseshoes and shotguns. You're just throwing one out there, and it's going to stick. <laughs> I'm going to go off the wall here and say Tony Kanaan. Okay. It's his right. it's great retiring. This is his last Indy 500 he's going to do. He's driving for McLaren. It was very impressive during all the practices and qualifying. I was watching the uh, morning show, the pre-show for the Indy 500 this morning, and they were they interviewed him and they were talking to him, and they, he said, I'm going all or nothing. I'm either yeah. going to win this thing or I'm going to wreck yeah. trying. So if I'm in the top two to three, when it comes down to the end of this race with, you know, five laps or less to go, the front guys better be watching out because I'm going all or nothing because I have nothing to lose. This is my last five Indy 500. And I promised my father when I was 13 years old, I would win it. I've won it a couple of times and I want to win it again. One last time for my dad. <laughs> so with that, yeah. That guy is one hell of a driver. I mean, you know, when when you start when you start a race, everything in your car, everything's cold. Every, the tires are, you know, cold. The air pressures are not up. And that guy is one driver that'll fucking hang it on the outside <laughs> and pass everybody in turn one and turn two, just out on the outside, out in the dirt, and just go around everyone. 
So if he's saying that, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he wins today and everything because he has that that drive, that motivation right there from what you said. And I, and I guess I, I guess I have to pick him because I got the shirt right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's and, so cool. So it's actually uh. So I had a I had a guy. Well, you, you know how I have my collection of, of the ATVs there, you know, my my two fifty Rs, and um, and sometimes you know I, I I rob Peter to pay Paul. So basically, I'll, I'll buy a quad and steal the parts that I want from it from my other two fifty Rs, and then just sell all the parts that are left over. So I sold a bunch of parts to a guy like two weeks ago, and I, or I sold a frame to him, the frame that I had that that the bike that parted out. And he's like, hey, I'm not going to be in town this week, but I'm going to come next weekend and pick it up from you. I'm like, all right, cool. Where, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going to go to, I have to go to Indianapolis for work and everything. I said, oh, right on. So then he, he got to Indianapolis last week to watch a lot of practices. And then as I, go, I was watching practice on, on uh, Peacock, and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. Because they're, they're they were just interviewing Tony Kanaan and they're showing him the shirt right here <laughs> and his jersey. And I was like, I want one of those shirts. So I text the guy to write back and they say, hey, are you at the speed right now? And he's like, yeah. He's like, go get me a youth larger of that shirt and, and I'll pay you when you come pick up your frame. So I want it for my son and everything. So, That's so, so it's kind cool. of there and then he back for me. <laughs> That's so cool. We're going we're gonna to roll back into... The question I asked you, Danny Ray, about the GNCC guys. So yeah. that XC1 Pro class, what what, they, what do they got going on there? So right now they got seven different winners on seven different events. From what I understand, in Ohio, it started raining in the middle of the race, and it made it very brutal. It all the riders when they came off, it was it was very brutal. Um, there's only been one guy who is certain currently in uh points lead it looks like baylor jr um he's been consistent he has one finish out of the top five and the rest have been first or second and then a fourth and so he's ahead in points he's 10 10 points ahead but um it's it looks like there's a super competitive class there i mean anybody can win any weekend obviously there's been seven different winners and this is actually the first time that that has happened in GNCC history and they are saying that you can put a, a a blanket between a lot of them and they're right there for the beginning and then one guy just has a better weekend or a better ride and um it's it's kind of uh KTM Husqvarna running away with this thing they have most of the wins and they're they're in the top four for points and then you got some uh, two Cowies and a Yamaha to round out the top seven. So KTM is one, two, Husqvarna's one, two, Kawasaki's one, two, and Yamaha's one, one. And they're not sure who, who's going to win the title. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool coming from, from back in there. Um, ATVs this weekend, they race at uh, Sunset Ridge in Illinois, which was Max Lindquist, uh, basically his home track. And, uh, Joel Hetrick put on another riding school, uh, getting out front early and winning both motos. Uh, Chad Weenan coming in second and Bryce Ford in third. Um, those are the three guys rising to the to the top in, in the perspective uh, ATV Pro class. Um, you have from third back to eighth place, you know, they're they're a, a, having a fist fight every every race for those last few positions. Um, Bryce just seems to be breaking out into the third spot, which early in the season, it was Restrelli. And, and Restrelli's no slouch. He's just, he gets back in that group where they start fighting. And it's very difficult to to get out of that when, you know, seven of you guys are the same speed. You know, if you're the same speed as the two guys in front of you, it's going to be tough to pass them. They got to make a mistake. You got to get into some clean air. But the ATV Pro Class is is Joel Hetrick's to win or lose, uh, with just a few rounds to go. We have to shout out in the ATV world 
to the professional WMX. Uh, Kinsey, uh, Kinsey Osborne has won every moto this year so far. She's five for five. That means 10 moto wins. Um, she's only got uh, three rounds to go to, to win the title. We'll see how she does. Uh, Is she like 17 too? Uh, she's, uh, I think she's turning 18. Uh, Tori Matisic is perfect as well. She's won seven out of seven and works. Um, so the ladies are really putting it down. If we, we can't leave out the WXC gals, there is a huge battle going on between Hannah Hunter and Jessica Ilyoff, and they are going win for win, uh, punching back and forth, changing the leads. So, you know, shout out to the ladies out there. They're doing a great job and they're fun to watch too. If you've watched some of Hannah Hart's videos, man, that gal can ride. She'd ride circles around you, Chaz. Um, on a quad. On a quad. Don't, I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was also an F1 race this morning, and unfortunately, Red Bull won. Um, but uh, Max Verstappen led the whole thing and uh, and dominated. Um, Ocon was on the podium, and so was, um, I think, Alonzo. So um, good racing there. The, the Mercedes came in fourth and fifth. Um, I don't know what happened to the Ferraris. I don't even know how Ocon got up there. That guy's normally uh, a back marker. So do you think, uh, sorry not to, do you think Hamilton is going to Ferrari next year? No, Hamilton, from everything that I'm seeing, uh, he's going to stay with Mercedes. Um, I think most of the stuff you're seeing is media hype and they're just trying to stir the shit. Um, uh, the, the I don't shit. know if you know anything about it, Corey. I, I, I agree with you. I think they're just stirring, you know, the media hype and just trying to get the eyes of Mercedes to renew his contract and give him what he wants. Uh, I think he's he'll he'll stick it out because I mean he wants to win. He wants to win another championship. You know, Ferrari is. Ferrari's right there, but I mean, if they were like the dominating, I mean, it'd be different if he was starting to go to Red Bull because Red Bull's winning. <laughs> He's a better he, chance of winning a champion Red Bull, but. And Stephen Horner basically said, I don't want him. I got enough yeah. guys. Yeah. So I don't think he's going to experiment with it or, or try to help a team get to the championships. He, he wants to jump in a team that's already at a championship level. Right. What do you think, Chaz? You were getting ready to say something. Hey. Oh no, I was, I was going to say they, they, they're they're looking for stories because the series is boring right now. Verstappen's crushing it. <laughs> I think that they're going to find out that that guy's a cheater. But <laughs> that's just my opinion. I just can't. I just don't like the guy. I just can't stand him. Ever since F, uh, F, FIA gave him that t- first title and then gave him the second title by not punishing him for going over the the dollar figure. I mean, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just not, it's just not okay. So I have a question for you. Yes, sir. When Eichner and you were dominating works, were you guys cheating? No. We never was cheated. Hamilton cheating when he was dominating? And never cheated. Okay. Never got proven cheated. He's just that much better right now. <laughs> Touche. <Okay>. Touche. <laughs> Everybody, I want to thank you guys so much for coming on the show today. Uh, Chaz, I appreciate your insight on the motorcycles. I know that you have a way better knowledge of it than I do. And and Danny, you're reporting on the outdoor because you're such a huge fan. Corey, as always, brother, bringing your insight of all the different styles of racing to our show. Uh, that's what we are as we're a motorsports show. And we want to talk about it all. I really appreciate it. And to all the fans that are listening on your Memorial Day weekend, please make sure that you have a designated driver. Uh, enjoy your hamburgers, your hot dogs, your barbecues, your families. And remember to thank our military, our fallen heroes that have allowed us to be free and allowed us to have these amazing sports that we get to participate in. Um, in closing, you got anything else for us, Danny Ray? I have one question for Chaz. What's that? Who's going to win the 450 class in outdoor moto this year? Championship overall. I mean, it's going to be Jet, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm, I'm, unfortunately. Hoping, I'm hoping it's more interesting than that. <laughs> I'm not. I like runaways. Uh, I like I like Jet just for his personality. Yeah, it's it's fun to watch, but no, I'm 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 hoping I'm hoping for 
I'm hoping that Chase gets very gets more comfortable on different styles of tracks and then Jet's a little less comfortable on some of the like when we go back east, but I I don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's gonna be a, a jet show for the entire summer. And uh it's a little, a little unfortunate, but I hope I'm I'm hoping I'm wrong. You think well, I got one for you guys now. really quick and we'll get out of here. Yeah. Moto GP. The rumor is that Mark Marquez is going to come back to his old form and dominate. And that's what everybody's worried about based on his performance at the last race. I know he went down, but they're afraid of him. I, I, you can never count Mark Marquez out. The dude, the dude's awesome. One of the best that's ever done it for sure. Um, but he can't stay off the ground. The dude crashes a lot. The bike dude. Yeah. It, maybe, maybe if, if, if he moves from Honda, like I would love to see Mark Marquez on Ducati. Those bikes seem to be just super fast. That and is a dirty foul word you just said. I know. <laughs> I'd love to see him on a KTM. Rumor, rumor has it. They, they had a rumor that he was going to go to KTM. Uh, the KTM boss came out and said no. And uh, the Takati people might be quietly interested, but they have not said, but Honda is feverishly working with him to, to make any changes to that motorcycle to keep him on Honda. So I think Honda, I think Honda is going to do it. I think they're going to keep him. Yeah, I, they should, but I, man, I, he just needs to stay off the ground. If, if he can stay off the ground and stay healthy for a whole season, absolutely. He could come back and be a champion. It's it's no doubt. Right. Corey, I know you want to go watch the race, brother. Hey, again, thank you, everybody. Have an amazing day. It was a great show. I really appreciate it. We'll talk to you all later. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.